<clears throat> Denmark is often used in, in this uh, uh, narrative uh, where people say, well, socialism didn't work, but on the other hand, um, Denmark is kind of interventionist, isn't it? So uh, maybe interventionism doesn't work. So what I want to do is to tell you a little bit about what the Danish economy is actually like, uh, what are the uh, basis of the relative strength of the Danish economy and the strengths and weaknesses of having a large welfare state, uh, and some of the reforms that have been put into place in Denmark and has strengthened the Danish economy. Um, even in the U.S. presidential debate, uh, there's a uh, discussion about whether the U.S. could be more like Denmark, and Hillary Clinton wisely said the U.S. is not Denmark. That is correct, uh, but it's not just a banal uh, fact. Uh, I, I think there's a, there's, a deeper, um, uh, uh, there's a deeper understanding here that the countries can't just copy each other. Denmark is a small, uh, historically very homogenous country, a uh, very open economy, and uh, the, the, the Danish experience is very specific. But I think there are some general things that uh, you can learn from Denmark, especially in another small open economy like uh, the uh, Slovak uh, economy. Uh, I'll start with my conclusions. Um, Denmark was rich and well functioning well before establishing the welfare state. So it's not because of the welfare state that Denmark is a uh, rich and well-functioning country. Of course we're richer now, but so is every other country. And that has to do with innovation and technological development. Um, and apart from the uh, tax and spend nature of the Danish economy, and uh, we have the highest tax burden in the world, but apart from that, Denmark is a relatively free market economy. Uh, and Denmark's wealth can be attributed to economic freedom. Uh, we just heard about economic freedom, so I won't go into that in detail. I'll save me a few minutes. Um, high taxes and redistribution does hurt the wealth uh, creation uh, and does cause serious economic and social problems in Denmark, and I'll briefly touch on those. But 30 years of market-oriented reforms have kept the Danish economy afloat and relatively competitive. So I'll touch on some of those reforms, uh, but there have been uh, an enormous amount of reforms, and they keep coming every one or two years, there's a small, uh, major or smaller reform, and with every uh, new government there are aims of increasing the labour supply through reforms, or uh, lowering certain distortionary taxes, etc. Okay. So, busting a myth about the Danish uh, economy, about Denmark. Um, are we wealthy because of the welfare state? No. Um, let's have a look at what, how long has Denmark had a welfare, welfare state? Well, if we look at the tax burden in Denmark, up until the late 50s, as you can see, or oh, the early 60s uh, even, uh, we had a tax rate that was comparable to what they had in the US. So Denmark was a low tax country as late as the early 60s. And then by the mid late 60s, things were changing and uh, we became a high tax country with a large welfare state. So that's a fairly recent experience. And as it only the development in that direction uh, didn't really run for more than a couple of decades before the Danish economy ran into a tremendous economic crisis and we needed to react to that. Um, and since then we've been moving in a more market-oriented market direction, although, as you can see, the, the tax burden is still very high and that is something that will have to come down at some point in the future. But. The welfare state is something that is a recent phenomenon from the mid-60s or so. Uh, that is not the case of Danish wealth, as you can see from this graph, and then I'll just briefly explain it. It's, uh, it's a graph showing uh, the relative wealth of Denmark compared to uh, 12 Western European countries and to the US. Uh, so the blue one is the uh, European countries, 
and the green one on top of that is the trend line because there's a lot of stuff going on during world wars, etc. And as you can see, the Danish, uh, anywhere above one means that Denmark is more wealthy. And uh, as you can see, Denmark became more wealthy than the uh, average of Western Europe um, in, in the period from 1900 onwards and peaked around 1930 to 1950. So the, the, the glorious days of the Danish economy in terms of relative wealth, uh, the time when we were at our best in terms of being at the technology frontier of what was possible at that time. We were much poorer then than we are now, obviously, given that we didn't have the internet or container transportation or uh, mobile phones or you know all of that. Uh, but given the technology frontier at the time, Denmark was at its best at getting to the limits of that frontier in the 1930s to 50s. And then it's, there's been a relative decline. So we were wealthy way, long before the welfare state. So I think the way you need to think about that is that you need wealth, you need a capitalist society in order to be able to afford a welfare state. Um, but still, Denmark does relatively well despite the welfare state. And how, how is that possible? How, how is it possible to have a small open economy with very high taxes uh, and, and needing to be competitive despite of very high costs? Um, the ideal framework for uh, having a strong innovation process that makes it possible to have high productivity is to have uh, competition, uh, ease of entry, so that new entrepreneurs can enter the economy with new ideas and get a foothold and expand these new ideas and expand new technologies into the economy. You need consumer choice and you need prices. You also need rewards to risk. You need good protection of private property. You need regulatory certainty. It's also great to have uh, market conform regulation, uh, so that is regulation that helps markets rather than hinder markets. Uh, but the most important thing in terms of regulation is, is probably certainty. Um, and then you need low taxation on the returns to risk. Uh, that is uh, what we just heard about, uh, basically what economic freedom is about, and in the economic freedom index, uh, Denmark is very well positioned. Uh, these are the sub-indices of the Economic Freedom Index. Um, and as you can see, we're doing very well on most of the sub-indices, uh, 17th, 10th, 7th, 8th, but then, then there's the size of government, we're number 157, uh, 154, okay, so we're doing bad on that. But that is being compensated by all the, all the others. So we have an open economy with um, uh, labor unions supporting free trade, uh, with uh, ex exporting half of our uh, production. We have a very flexible labor market. We have uh, fairly free banking. Taxpayers did not uh, bail out banks in Denmark. There were bailouts, but taxpayers didn't end up uh, footing a bill. Um, and we have very low inflation. So we have a very strong free market capitalist system and within that, we have a welfare state. In the Economic Freedom Index, uh, we are one of them. This, I'm using a different one from the one uh, uh, used before. Um, um, and in this one, we're number 22nd. In the other one, I think Denmark is uh, around 11th uh, position, uh, which is fairly high. So uh, the Slovak Republic has uh, a little bit of climbing to do to get up to uh, uh, up to that level. Um, another way of looking at that is uh, if you look to take out the size of government and just look at how is Denmark doing compared to all other countries on the other four sub-indices, you can see that Denmark is very economically free on all the other four except on the size of government. So the other four are compensating for the fact that we have a very large public sector. Still, the High, the, the large public sector, uh, the large the high taxes, large transfer payments is harming the economy. Here you can see what happened 
when we created the welfare state, the, the proportion of the population that became either dependent on public transfers or public sector employees. We have two million people who are dependent on public transfers out of a population of 5.6, and we have uh, now a public sector of uh, around 800,000 people. So that's way over half the population who are actually uh, public sector employees or living on transfer payments. So they all personally benefit from a larger government and higher taxes. That also creates certain political problems, as you can imagine. Um, that's a cost of the large welfare state. Now, this is obviously a very simplistic way of describing a very complex uh, development. Uh, economic history in Denmark is more complicated than that, but I think if you want to simplify it, this is a, a reasonable way of doing it. We've been through a development where we moved away from a market-oriented direction uh, 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 model and uh, towards uh, interventionism, towards a large welfare state. Uh, and then we had crisis Denmark in the uh, early 80s, Sweden in the early 90s, and after that we've had a series of reforms. Uh, these are some of the reforms that took place in all of the countries. Sweden had a huge tax reform, lowering the marginal tax rate, abolished her inheritance tax, uh, tax uh, and different other uh, um, uh, processes. In, in Denmark, we cut the unemployment benefit period and the, the level of unemployment benefit. We pegged the Danish krona to uh, what is now the euro, was the Deutsche Mark. Uh, marginal tax rate cuts, retirement reform, and all kinds of other reforms. That wasn't easy. This is a picture from uh, the uh, mid 80s. It's the then Danish Prime Minister, Paul Sluda, he was conservative, longest sitting Prime Minister. Uh, in post-war time, when you see that picture, you can uh, you can wonder how that was possible. Uh, and that that was pretty much the atmosphere at the time. It was very tough to introduce those kinds of reforms, but what happened was that uh, they got going. And since then, a lot of different governments have carried out reforms. And these are some of the effects. This is the effect on structural employment. So structural employment increases when you lower transfer payments, when you make the labor market more flexible in different ways. Um, and all kinds of reforms have been taking place. We used to have an unemployment benefit period that was, in effect, uh, indefinite. Then it was lowered to 11, to 7, to 4, and now 2 years. I think 2 years is still too long, but it's better than 11. Um, this is what happened to the top marginal tax rate on the different governments, as you can see. The corporate tax rate is coming down to the 20, so watch out, Slovakia. Um, and um, expected official retirement age. We've indexed our retirement age to uh, long longevity. So we will have an automatic increase in re the retirement age as, as people live longer. And that's uh, a broad uh, uh, agreement between political parties. We pri pretty much privatized uh, pension. We still have a, 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 a basic uh, taxpayer finance pension, but uh, to many people, the private uh, individual accounts are their main source of income when they, when they become pensioners. So my conclusion is that you can have capitalism without the welfare state, but you can't have the welfare state without capitalism. Thank you.